We live in a time when our idea of community is frayed, strained due to our busy lives, challenged by the political landscape and competing responsibilities. Some of us believe that getting involved will not change anything. Fortunately, there are many people in our community who are doing something about the conditions in which we live. This show will <clears throat> uh, introduce you to one person who is making a difference and will show you that all of us can make a difference and that the power of one is within all of us. Welcome to the power of one. Alex, um, today my guest is Alex Nogales from the National Hispanic Media Coalition. So I want to thank him for being here today and you're the executive director uh, of that esteemed organization which is actually located here in Pasadena. You're downgrading my title. I'm president and CEO. <laughs> Good. I'm glad that you corrected me on that because um, I don't want to um, uh, diminish your stature in any way, shape, or form. Thank you. So just to start off, um, what is the mission of NHMC, and um, you know, what, are your, what are your goals and objectives? Sure. The National Hispanic Media Coalition is a 32-year-old nonprofit organization. And what we do are two things, really, basically. We create opportunities for Latinos both in front and in back of the camera. We also do telecommunications um, in terms of legal uh, wranglings, uh, legal things that have to do with that. So we have two offices, one here in Pasadena mm -hmm. that handles the entertainment industry, that handles the journalistic industry, and then we have another one in Washington, D.C., and there we, is where we have the telecommunications team, three lawyers that we have mm -hmm. over there that day in and day out uh, toil to have network neutrality, lifeline, and issues such as that that they battle day in, day out. What we do here in Pasadena is that we have memorandums of understanding with ABC, NBC, CBS, and Fox that were signed 17 and, and uh, 16 years ago. A long and time ago. A long, long time ago. And what we do with those memorandums, if they give us their data, their work data, mm -hmm. and from there we can see how many Latinos um, they have in the workforce, and also how many Asian Pacific Americans and how many African Americans and how many uh, Native Americans. Um, it, it was these four groups that forged that, um, those memorandums. And, and just to clarify, you advocate for the other um, cultural groups as well and not just Latinos? Yes, of course, yeah. especially when we uh, talk about telecommunications. The problems of all the groups that we yeah. just named are one and the same. Mm -hmm. You know, access to um, uh, the internet, access to uh, low prices, consumer prices that are reasonable, that are something that we can all afford. Mm -hmm. So um, we are four organizations in one. We call ourselves the Ethnic Media Coalition, and we mm -hmm. sign together with ABC, NBC, CBS, and Fox. And it is about one helping the other. Sometimes we take on projects by ourselves, but we pull our allies in. I'm a big believer in coalitions. Coalitions work, you know? Yeah. And the more allies that you have, the more you can get done. Yeah, and that was something I wanted to ask about you, uh, and I'm, I'm going to investigate a little more about the memorandums that you have. But how do you, how do you get people to trust one another? How do you get, um, what's the glue that holds the coalition together? Um, what's your secret? Because I know you've been pretty darn successful over the years at bringing different organizations together. So how does that work? You have to be transparent. No. You have to do for yourself and your group the same as you would do for them. Yeah. You know, and when you are like that, people let you in. So now I'm very close friends with my allies. And as a consequence of that, they tell their friends about Latinos on this side of the aisle, mm -hmm. and I tell them about them. And so the, the organization members get closer and closer yeah. together. And we have, each one of us has a bigger coalition. For example, yeah. the National Hispanic Media Coalition is part and parcel of the National Latino Media Council. And there we have 12 national organizations that do the same thing that we do, mm -hmm. or that support what we do. I happen to be secretariat and have been the secretariat for the last, oh, 15 years or so since we started the association. Mm -hmm. And we have the big organizations there so um, when we talk, we carry a big, big stick. Yeah. So an example of that might be, I understand recently you went to CBS and you talked to staff there about, again, this whole notion of um, equity, making sure that um, Latinos are represented both in front of the camera and behind the camera. 
But you went with another organization. What, who, what was that organization and yeah. um, how and why them? How did that work out? Well, let me tell you first um, um, why we work at this. It's a civil rights organization, okay? Yeah. And um, how we are perceived is the way that we're always going to be treated. So Latinos in this nation right now are not treated very well. Yeah. We did a, a, a big survey not too long ago, two years ago now, but it's mm -hmm. been updated, as to what do non-Latinos think about Latinos and where do they get their information How from. did you apply the survey? How was it applied, or how we was it implemented? We an organization that this is what oh, they okay. do. It's a polling. Yeah. you know, type of organization. And what came out of that is that over 30% of non-Latinos think that the majority of Latinos residing in the United States are here without documentation. Also, that the majority... The majority? Yes. Really? Also, that um, Latinos as a whole come from gang-infested yeah. backgrounds. Incredible. Incredible. So those are the kinds of things that we have to battle. Now, you know, if you're invisible, to the population, if in yeah. fact they don't know that yes, you are grape pickers, and you know there's nothing wrong with being that, or you work uh, at a car wash or any of those jobs that traditionally we don't think very much of, but that people have to do because they have to survive. To survive, yeah. Um, you know, to be depicted only in that one dimension is very unfair to the population because we're also doctors, we're also lawyers, we're also yeah. police officers, just like and everybody presidents else. and CEOs. As well, as well. So your question, you know, I, I have to always say that to people so oh, they yeah. understand, yeah. you know, why we do what we do. Mm -hmm. I mean, I come from a generation, Brian, where there were signs up and down the state of California as we were picking the, cr the uh, crops uh, in season, uh, both fruits and vegetables. There were signs up and down the state of California that said no dogs or Mexicans allowed. Mm. Think what that does to a kid. You look at that and it's, it's going to diminish you. It's going to make you feel like you're not as good as everybody right. else. So you're an outsider. You're the other. You know yeah. what I mean? So you, you're dehumanized yeah. is exactly what happens. Yeah. So that's actually part of the strategy is how do you recraft the narrative? How do you tell a different story and do it sufficiently to counterbalance uh, the belief system that all those people have. What, it's difficult. Yeah. You present, uh, you have to get people into the industry because I said to you, a lot of people think this and where do they get their information from? They get it from television. Yeah. First and foremost from television. Television is 24 hours a day. You know, uh, it is seven days a week. I mean, it's constant, right there, right there in yeah. your face. It's entertainment and it's also news. So if they're only reporting part of the news about the Latino community, or if you're absent, or you're being depicted always in these low social mm -hmm. economic uh, conditions, they're going to have an idea as to who you are. You don't have to be very considerate of Latinos if that's who you are. Yeah. The president did precisely that when he accuses of being rapists and criminals and worse, okay? Right, that was a reprehensible comment he made during yeah. the campaign. That's right. Yeah. So you, you have to overcome all of those kinds of things, and you do it by forcing the networks to bring in people from different stations that yeah. have a different narrative, that are also successful lawyers and doctors and everything else. In terms of news, you have, we have a lot of experts, just like everybody else. Yeah. When, in fact, the network uh, is doing a show in Cuba, for example, it'd be derelict not to have Latinos discussing mm -hmm. Cuba, you know, or Mexico or any other city. Yeah. And oftentimes, if you look at CNN or if you look at some of the other cable programs, you will find that they're talking about issues that belong to Latinos, say, for example, and there's not a Latino in the group. Right, right. <laughs> so there's no authenticity and there's no um, uh, accuracy. That's right. So That's And no correct. connection with the culture. Yeah. So what did happen at CBS recently? Um, I thought that was remarkable that, that you were able to accomplish something. That, uh, the numbers have been very bad, uh, not only at CBS, but also at Fox at ABC and NBC, historically very, very bad. And we finally reached a tipping point where we said, no more. We can't have this yeah, anymore. You're not going to accept it. Yeah, we're not going to accept it. So for the last two and a half months, uh, Brian, I think I told you this already, but I've been training 35 Latino leaders to lead a boycott, if that's what it came mm. out to to lead an advertising campaign against the um, 
organization to lead in getting people to write letters mm -hmm. to the networks, to get, get letters to the advertisers, as I said, yeah. to bring about such a, a, mm -hmm. a feel against uh, NCBS yeah. that they would be hard pressed not to accept some of our demands. Now, I have to tell you that we met with the top fellow over there, uh, yeah. Leslie Mumbes, and I have to tell you that we were surprised. I came in ready to uh, fight. Yeah, to say we're going to boycott yeah. you and we're going to protest and we'll write letters. Look what happened. He doubled the number of Latino regulars on his shows. He doubled the number of Latino writers on his shows. He did that in two and a half months. Mm -hmm. So it just goes to tell you that when someone wants to do something yeah. for whatever the motivation, you know, they do it, yeah. they get it done. Yeah, and I think that's part of your uh, strategy too, is to find the motivating factor or the, the kind of the magical um, change agent that'll help them to, to make a different decision. That's right, and now we're friends. Now we're friends, yeah. he called me a while ago to thank me for the meeting yesterday. Yeah. I thanked him for the meeting. He's the one that signed the memorandum of understanding 17 years ago. Yeah. And I said to him, you know, or he said to me, first of all, you know, when we started this journey, he said, uh, we both had dark hair. Yeah. Said, yeah. And I said, and I looked at you when you came into the room and I thought, I said, gee, I remember this guy as being much taller, yeah. you know? <laughs> Yeah, time changes. Yes. Um, I, I want to talk for a couple of minutes. Uh, you mentioned it earlier. It's uh, net neutrality. So first of all, from your perspective, um, maybe just briefly, because I think a lot of people are confused about it. From your perspective, what is net neutrality? And then secondly, why is it so important? OK, net neutrality really is uh, um, being able to get into the tubes, into the internet, and not be restrained by um, tears where they put you in a slow tier, a medium tier, and mm -hmm. then if you pay a lot of money on a high tier, okay? It is also the capacity to not have throttling done to you. It is also the capacity of not being charged more mm -hmm. than what you would charge somebody so else. So depending on your usage, you would be charged extra. Yeah. yeah. And, and so basically, I could go on and on and on, but that's really what it's about. Yeah. It's a consumer issue, it's a civil rights issue. If you don't have the money to be able to afford uh, having the internet at your house, you're going to be left out in education, in job searches, and so forth. There are companies right now yeah. that don't accept applications, you know, handwritten at their stores or whatever. Mm. They only process them online. if you send it to them online. Yeah. Incredible. But that's where we're heading. I didn't know how to um, use the internet until about 10 years ago. I didn't know how to type. And so my daughters were typing away and credits, talking to all these different people. I said, well, I can do that. If they can do it, I can do it. Yeah. So I learned to type, and now I correspond daily with yeah. hundreds of people. You're probably on social media all the time, too. As do, well. you, do you tweet? No, I don't, and I have to tell you but that it's I... probably better you don't. <laughs> <laughs> it seems to be misused yeah. these days. I have two individuals that that's what they do all day long. They, they handle uh, social media because mm -hmm. it's such a powerful force. And remember, it isn't just about us at our age, it's about the kids. If you mm -hmm. go down the street, you see them right here doing this. Yeah. They communicate that way, they pass information that way, you know? And so it's a powerful tool. Yeah, that's actually another area that I think is interesting. Um, so NHMC has been around a long time. Uh, these issues have been waged, you know, Cesar Chavez and um, <clears throat> the, um, <clears throat> the growers um, in the Central Valley. And so this has been going on for decades. So what strategies or what um, ways are you getting young people involved and getting them excited about whether it's saving net neutrality or whether it's diversity um, in media? You know, all of the issues that are really important to you and freedom of speech as well. Um, how, do you, how do you galvanize millennials to um, participate in your work? Um, to a large degree, through social media. Mm -hmm. And I do a lot of public speaking at schools and universities and so mm -hmm. forth. It is about um, intruding into the lives of people so that they understand what is at stake. Mm -hmm. Who is not going to yeah. be in favor of having their children go to a major university if they've got the grades. Who's not going to want that? Yeah. Every parent in America wants their children to do better than they did. 
So we are opening those doors of understanding, those doors of a sophistication. Look, my parents, they had a first uh, grade mm -hmm. education and a third grade education, but they stressed education. And in, in our lifetime, all four of us went to a university. Mm -hmm. And it wasn't just because, it was because they put it upon themselves that we had to have a better life than what they had. They were um, migrant farm workers, and we did the same thing, okay? But we couldn't stay in the field forever and survive. That's hard work. That's really hard work. Yeah, one of the questions I was going to ask you is why are you so passionate about your um, position and your role and NHMC? And I think you've answered it to a considerable amount, the, the fact that um, you saw your parents struggle and you saw the people around them struggle and you understand what, what it's like to um, be a marginalized part of the community and a, a part of the community that isn't embraced and is disenfranchised. Um, but is there, why else, what, why do you get up at 5.30 in the morning and, and get excited about going to work? For all the reasons that you talked about, okay? Also, I'm at the age where, look, there's only so many cigs that I can eat in a day, okay? <laughs> and so if you consider what were you put on earth to do, yeah. okay? God put us here, not, not such a big, you know, believer that I'm going to thump, you know, the Bible and so forth, but God put us here so that we could make a difference, so that we could make it better, not only for yeah. ourselves and our communities, but communities across the world. You worked um, in Guatemala near the Honduras border. You know yeah. what poverty does to a people. You have to lift people up to a better standard of living for a better understanding of, of why they have to have education. So I do it for all those reasons. My dad uh, was a philosopher with a third grade education. This guy would sit out during the fields and say to everybody, you know, we have to do better, and the yeah. only way we're gonna do better is if we, our children go to school. We have to go to colleges and universities. And Rasa, you know, other Latinos, uh, would laugh at my dad, ah, yeah, oh sure, yeah, la, 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 la. And my father would, would insist, my daughters are going, you're crazy, your daughters are gonna go? No, they're gonna get married at 16, 17, or 18, and that's the end of that. And my father persisted. And these guys used to ride him mercilessly. Yeah. And I would get so angry at my dad, because my dad was a tall Mexican. He was 5'10", you know, and everybody else around him was 5'6", five, 5'7", five, yeah. thereabouts. And I would get angry at my dad because he didn't get up and beat him up. You know, that's <laughs> what I wanted him to do. He didn't do that. He didn't need to. He just, he lived he practiced what he preached. He just lived it. He yeah, didn't need to beat yeah. them up. When I went to the service, I used to fight a lot, physically fight a lot. Oh. I was in the infantry, and I was in peak uh, physical condition, and um, I didn't want to be my dad, so I fought a lot, you oh. know, at the, at the smallest provocation. Then I came back from the service, and I saw my dad, and I listened to my dad, and Brian, I did this. I went full circle, and in many ways, I've become my dad. I what, do you, dad. what would he say about you now? I he would be proud. He would be proud. He would say it was worth it. I think so. And yeah. especially the legacy, you were talking about your children as well, yeah. um, and this whole notion of education, yeah. um, which leads me back to NHMC. There is a program that you have that's directly related to education. It's the writer's program. Can you talk about that for sure. a couple of minutes? I came up as a writer. I went to UCLA, graduated from there, and um, I wanted to be in film and television. I knew that that's where I was going to end up. And um, I became a writer, you know? Being a writer was um, economically easy. All you need is a pencil and a piece of paper, and you write a scene or whatever. So I used to write children's uh, programs, television programs. And, and so I saw the power of the writer. You know, mm. you can't have a play, you can't have a television show or a film without someone imagining it and putting it down on paper. Yeah. So I knew that if we were going to make a beachhead into the entertainment industry, that it had to be through the writing part of it. Now that program has mm. been in place for about 15 years now. Mm -hmm. We have graduated something like a, uh, it's very intensive, okay? It's five weeks of the writing day in, day out, okay? Um, I knew that eventually some of these writers would get into the industry and some of them over a period of time would become show creators. And that's exactly where we are right now. 
We have 35 writers working at ABC, NBC, CBS, Fox, uh, Disney. They're working. What are some of the shows that they're working on? Um, you know, you name them. They're all there. Yeah. And one of them is now an executive producer on one of the shows. It's an animation yeah. uh, show. It's called Elena Afavinar. Oh. And she started off as a writer in a writer's program, mm. climbed to be a writer there, and then became a producer, and now is executive producer. Yeah. So stories um, have the power to change people's hearts and minds. That's right. And I think that's what you were talking about, especially when um, you're thinking about uh, the battle of um, words or the battle of, in our society, um, around race, around culture, around um, yeah. prejudice, around um, discrimination. And so if you, if those people can start telling stories of people are being discriminated against and put it into a manner that is attractive to watch on, or is entertaining, then I think that that helps um, shift our society. And I think um, we've seen that quite a bit with um, uh, LGBT um, rights and a lot of the changes and shifts because shows like Modern Family portrayed um, you know, uh, gay families in a little bit different light and so there's been more support. What, um, what do you think about utilizing television or using um, stories to try to change the hearts and minds of some of the tougher people in our There's society. There's no other way to do it, right? Yeah. We've got to tell different kinds of stories that are free of prejudice, that are free of hate. And right now in this country, we have a hate mentality. It's yeah. us against them type of situation. Problem is that hate speech leads to hate crimes. Mm -hmm. And vulnerable communities, whether they be LGBT, whether they be Latinos, Muslim, Sikhs, whatever they can be, are getting beat up. The numbers from the FBI have come out, and hate crimes against people from different communities are sky high. And yeah. it is because it comes directly from the yeah. top. Yeah, it started at the beginning of the year, and yeah. I think um, um, people who have that mindset have been given um, a license, in a sense, to... to been emboldened. Yeah, been emboldened. been emboldened. What we just saw in, in Virginia right. is precisely that. Those people felt that they could march out there with torches and clubs and even rifles in some cases, okay, yeah. and that it would be all right. For the president of this country to excuse it or equate them with the demonstrators is incredibly bad. Yeah. Yeah, and that's what I also have noticed with NHMC is it comes out with statements on uh, national issues or issues of concern, and so... Uh, well, we've gone further than that, Brian. Uh, what we have done uh, three months before the elections of last November, we saw and understood that if uh, Trump was going to become elected, that we would have problems in terms of hate speech. Right. So whether he got elected or not, we decided to move. So we built a coalition against hate, 57 mm. organizations strong now from across the country. And it consists of every group from every vulnerable community. And we have a website where people can uh, communicate with one another, mm -hmm. talk about what can you do against hate crimes, against hate speech, um, what are the tools that you can defend yourself with, and so mm -hmm. or tools meaning the internet, going to the sheriff's department, um, reporting you know, what has happened to you and informing the population as well of what is going on in different parts of the country. Very, very important. Yeah, that coalition is uh, strategic and it's also um, uh, visionary, I think, because uh, it's, it's a mechanism by which we can combat um, the hate speech that's going on. But a, a slightly different um, angle on our perspective is, so how how do we get some of those people who were carrying the torches and who were carrying the, the clubs to think differently? How, what, what do you think an approach would be to get them to understand that their issues are actually similar to issues of other people in the community and that there really is not um, the threat that they perceive it to be? You know, Brian, uh, most of the people are so ingrained with hate now that you're never going to no. change them. You know, they're going to end up in prison if not for marching and hitting people for a crime, you know, battery or yeah. assault or whatever. They're so far gone 
and so consumed with their hate that they can't see straight anymore. Maybe there'll be one here and one there and so forth. And I hope that there will be. Yeah. But you can't count on that. You can only count on the reality that is right there. Trump is telling us, has been telling us who he is and what he stands for for, for a year now, okay? Yep. And we didn't believe him. So we elected him president of this country. And a lot of people are uh, mourning the fact that that's exactly what happened. And they're turning back yeah. and back and back and saying, how could we have done that? How could we have been fooled into thinking that he was going to be so much better? Yeah, some buyer's remorse. Um, just to be thinking, um, kind of to wrap things up, I wish we had more time because this has uh, been a fascinating conversation. But um, what, would you, what would you like people to do to help you accomplish your mission? If we're thinking about folks in Pasadena or in the broader LA area, how can they help you? What, yeah. what are some um, uh, suggestions you've had, well, you'd have? You know, if you're Latino, I would say to you, go to our website, see what we stand for, uh, join us in this fight against uh, uh, bigotry, against intolerance. Uh, if you have an interest in the arts, look at the programs that we offer so that you can avail yourself of them and climb up the ladder, whether you be a uh, director or a writer and so forth. I would say, you know, as well, go to the Coalition Against Hate so that you mm -hmm. and your family are secure in your environment and don't have to worry day in and day out that somebody's going to deport you that someone is going to club you, that someone is going to transpass against, against you. So information is power. Yeah. Information has always been power. So the more we know about the world that we live in, whether it be Latino or non-Latino, doesn't matter. And if you fight for justice and civil rights, you can't yeah. just fight for your group. You've got to fight for everybody. Yeah, and you said if you're Latino, go to the website, but I'm not Latino. Um, can website. I go to the website too? Absolutely. There will be everything that is open to us as Latinos is open to you yeah. for Latinos as well. Yeah. And I think that's a really, really um, great starting point. Um, so I hope that they find um, places to connect, um, organizations that they can support, and then also um, uh, the language that they need to be able to um, uh, fight back to a certain extent. When everything is said and done, Brian, we're all in it together. Yeah, I agree. So I want to thank you for being here today. It's been a real pleasure. Uh, and I'm so impressed with your work and so pleased that it's, it's kind of like you measure um, uh, impact by thinking about if it didn't exist. So if NHMC didn't exist, we would have to create one yeah. because it's so impactful, it's so important for our community. Thank you so thank you for the work that you do and thank you for being here today. Absolutely.